Hello, my name is Raj Chako, and today I would like to talk to you about hyperconvergence. I would like to spend a few minutes discussing what is a hyperconverged solution, what are some of the key advantages of hyperconvergence inside the data center, and who are some of the players that are out there, and what are some of the disadvantages of a hyperconverged solution as well. But before I get into the crux of what is hyperconvergence, I would like to walk you through a few minutes of memory lane uh, into the data center evolution. If you look at today's data centers, we essentially have a plethora of components in different silos. We have the storage silo where you have storage components from you know, a variety of vendors, NetApp, EMC, Hitachi, for example. And then the other big silo is the networking piece. You typically would see a networking a tier, a variety of switches from Cisco, Juniper, etc. Then, then there is the compute aspect of things. That's the third element. And then we also have the biggest change that kind of is driving this data center metamorphosis, which is the hypervisor layer or the virtualization layer. So all these different silos really create a complex problem in terms of managing the data center and consuming resources inside the data center. One of the ways that the industry tried to address this complexity was bringing together all these independent components uh, into a more of a single unified managed infrastructure. Hence, we created a converged infrastructure where you would have multiple vendors come together and they would put together a design which with a stamp of approval where you have your storage, your compute, and your network all kind of bundled together. Sometimes uh, in, in a single appliance-like form factor, uh, I wouldn't say appliance form factor, appliance feel where you can have all these things brought together inside the data center on a single rack, for example, a V-block. Now, all these solutions, the converged solutions, don't really solve the key problem, which is simplifying end-to-end -end and being able to provide a single interface to manage and monitor all these elements together. Because you still have all these different vendors that come into play. You know, you have disks from a disk vendor, switches and networking from a network vendor, compute from a different vendor, and of course the virtualization tier, which could be VMware, Microsoft, or perhaps Red Hat or KVM or open source hypervisors. So hyperconvergence solves quite a lot of these challenges. What hyperconvergence essentially tries to do is bring all these components into a single scalable infrastructure in a bite-sized chunk. So imagine having a single server that will bring your components of networking, virtualization, storage, and compute as a single unified system managed by a single piece of software and which is also scalable, meaning if you just need to buy a single appliance, just purchase a single device, and then as you need to grow, you would add more and more devices, and it scales linearly as and when you need it. So this solves the classic problem of a large capital expenditure every few years when you have to buy a new uh, array or a, a giant V block, for example. When we look at hyperconvergence, one of the key pieces that stands out from all the vendors that provide a, some sort of hyperconverged solution is the storage integration. You see, with the converged infrastructure stack, uh, we, we were able to solve a lot of the classic issues, for example, networking, because networking became embedded into the hypervisor. Uh, when you talk about computing, computing got virtualized by VMware. But when it came to storage, you still had this challenge of how do you manage your storage? You would still have to create LUNs. You would have to create partitions and volumes and present it to the hypervisor that then would make those, uh, the file system available to the operating system uh, or the application itself. One of the other advantages of a hyperconverged system is the fact that you're able to provide better lifecycle management on the system. So, for example, you are able to migrate into a newer, more, better, faster hardware um, as time progresses, and you can wean off or, or get rid of your older, older devices. So it's much easier to, 
to migrate into new hardware as time progresses. Some of the key vendors that are out there that come to mind is Nutanix. Nutanix has about 50% of market share. There is Simplivity, there is uh, SpringPath, uh, there are a bunch of other small companies as well that are building software to manage the system. If you really think about it, this is actually software managed storage embedded into the hypervisor system. That's what it really is. It's like a software defined system. Now, why is everyone so excited about hyperconvergence? If you think about all these players out there and why everybody is out there to make a solution to fill this market, it would make perfect sense because according to IDC and Wikibon, we are talking about a 15 to 38 billion, billion with a B, market opportunity from 20 20 to about 2030. In the next 10 to 12 years, we're talking about a close to a $40 billion industry that's going to be available. Now, most of this will absolutely be at the expense of the traditional storage vendors. Uh, so I can clearly see that, uh, you know, all the other players, for example, IBM, HP, all the server manufacturers, everybody's going to get into this game of hyperconvergence. So we want to make sure that as Cisco employees, we prep ourselves and understand how the solution works and be ready for the next transition inside the data center.